to finish off this session, then I'm going to talk um, about uh, historical administrative data. Uh, I'm going to start with the motivations, so why we might be wanting to do it, although Elaine's, at, Elaine's already actually been making the, the case for this. I'm going to talk about two examples in Scotland, uh, just because I'm involved in them, but hopefully they'll do two things at least. One is uh, to whet your appetite to this kind of linkage, uh, and then maybe help clarify why you might be wanting to do this, but also to, to introduce some of the methodological challenges and techniques that, uh, I, that we've been using that I think uh, are useful. So this is methodologies, not in terms of the analysis, but in terms of producing a research usable um, output. So th this, the work in Scotland I'm going to talk about is, uh, has been funded by the SRC and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, under the broad title Digitising Scotland, and it's a joint endeavour with the Universities of St Andrews, Edinburgh uh, and Cambridge. OK, but just to start then with some of the motivating examples, and looking at the, 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 the set I've uh, chosen, I, I realise they all emphasise the sort of health use of linked administrative or registry uh, data, and, and I guess probably this is one of the key uses you might make of this data, although I'll go on to talk about how also it'll be very useful for things like social mobility and transferring of wealth and other goods across generations. But there are a few key uh, data sets that have made use of uh, registry data uh, throughout time and uh, have had really very major impacts on our understanding of, uh, 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 as I said, mainly health or, or um, biological processes. So, for example, the, the Dutch uh, famine birth cohort centred around the uh, 1944 famine uh, in the Netherlands, so the uh, retreating uh, German army restricting uh, food to the northern part of uh, the, uh, to Holland, and the resulting exposure of mothers, and particularly, importantly, pregnant mothers, to food shortages, and therefore how that led us to understand both the impact on that generation, but importantly from an epigenetic position, position that that was actually passed on generations, uh, so that it wasn't just the, the, the children that were born to mothers that were exposed to that food shortage, it was the fact that those children, the next generation on then had an impact uh, on their children. So this is possible because of good registry data uh, and then follow through into a, a study. A very similar study in terms of epigenetics is the, and uh, apologies to any Swedish members of the audience uh, for my horrible pronunciation, the Overkalex study uh, in Sweden, which uh, was a similar design. So this was looking at food shortages uh, as measured by uh, records on famines, so sorry, uh, 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 we, uh, food production in years. So it was estimated from uh, the crop outputs, a shortage year and an abundant year. Uh, and that's looking then at uh, children being born towards the end of the uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, and uh, again, this is exposure to food shortages. In this instance, this was during the slow growth period, the uh, period immediately before puberty. And the interesting insight from that study, of course, was that there seemed to be a sex differentiation in the epigenetic passing on. So uh, fathers having an impact uh, on male uh, uh, offspring and a difference in female offspring, but the difference in the exposure between the, the sexes. Uh, and then thirdly, there's been the, the UK longitudinal studies, particularly the England and Wales longitudinal study, that's been incredibly important in terms of understanding uh, look, the, uh, examining health inequalities from a longitudinal perspective and the very early evidence uh, that countered the argument that health inequalities might be the result of people becoming uh, unwell and therefore seeing a, a drop in income uh, and therefore a residualisation of uh, those that were ill in low-income groups rather than the, the argument that it was poverty or, or uh, relative uh, uh, economic position that might cause uh, a health differentiation across the, the population. So three examples of them where linked routine and uh, administrative data then have been uh, extremely useful. Um, and so what we're striving here for then is really this construction of new cohort studies. Uh, of course, if a cohort study wasn't studied, uh, started at the time, then we have no ability unless we go back to uh, administrative uh, records. So 
in some ways, it's our one way of being able to look at these kind of issues, particularly what's happening to people that are now old in their childhood, but also, as these other examples show, if you can look at uh, uh, intergenerational uh, effects, then you have this possibility of looking at uh, even more interesting effects. Uh, and it's, of course, something that you can't look at if you're creating new cohort studies. You'd have to work, wait for many years, uh, maybe even hundreds of years, if you wanted to look at intergenerational effects. So it's our uh, our chance to, to do this. So I'm going to look at two examples that we've been working on in, in Scotland. Uh, the first one is uh, centred around the linkage of what's called the Scottish Mental Surveys of 1932 and 1947. This is one of these quirks of history that have produced a very uh, useful uh, data set. So these were two uh, large-scale surveys, so all 11-year-olds in Scotland in 1932 and 1947 sat uh, a cognitive ability uh, test. Uh, this has been followed up in a, a number of smaller-scale studies, the Lothian Birth Cohort Study and the Aberdeen Birth, birth, co birth, birth Cohort Study, that have produced very interesting findings, particularly in terms of neurodegenerative diseases in, in later life. So what's the impact of what's happening in childhood? Uh, cognitive ability is measured in childhood, and then uh, later life uh, uh, outcomes. So the second uh, data set I'll, I'll just briefly talk about is uh, a project looking at uh, transcribing and then making research available, uh, research ready, the Scottish Civil Registration data system. So that's information on birth, deaths, uh, and marriages uh, in Scotland. Okay, so the, the Scottish Mental Survey then is a, a cognitive ability test. It's these type of questions, sorry, it's a, a bit fuzzy. So, man is to clothes uh, as what is for fur? Coat, animal, bird, skin, cloth. So, who's awake? Ruth, are you volunteering a question? Answer. So, uh, a, 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 sim a, a fairly standard kind of uh, IQ test. So, this was. Uh, a set of questions then that was asked uh, of 11, all 11-year-old 11 children uh, in Scotland in 1932 and uh, 1947. So what we've done then is um, we've set around a process of uh, linking these data with uh, the set of administrative data that we have readily available uh, and then linking that forward to the Scottish Longitudinal Study. So the Longitudinal Study is a 5% sample of the Scottish population that links census registration data in the modern period uh, with things like health records and educational uh, records. So um, the challenge, of course, is then is a big linkage problem, uh, linking um, to events some um, 40 or 50 years before our main study exists. But we've benefited here from uh, a number of uh, interesting uh, aspects of, of the data. So the fact that in 1939, there was a, 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 not a census, but a registration of the population. This is, of course, the registration that led to the identity cards during the, the, the Second World War. And also, usefully, the registration number that become the, became the NHS number. Uh, so you can immediately see that we have fairly good, then, uh, uh, ability to link forward. So we've linked, then, the 1947 Scottish Mental Survey uh, back to a, a child's uh, 1939 register record. Uh, from that, uh, we can gather information um, on the family itself, so where they were living, the household members, including things like occupation, so we can start looking at social class and therefore start thinking about <laughs> what's happening to a child uh, in their infancy, uh, and then back to their, their birth record. Uh, and also forward through to death records that's a mysterious up to. Oh, it's not going to reveal what date it's up to. I think it's the 1970s. Um, and then from the 1939, utilising things like the fact that it's the NHS uh, number to link forward to our, our existing study that started in the 1990s. Um, and then matching uh, between uh, the earlier record of death up to where it became electronic, we can fully record death uh, up to the period of our study, and then, of course, we can register um, uh, deaths if they occur to members who are still, uh, were still alive in 19, the 1990s. Um, and then, because this is a census-linked study, then, of course, we can look at highest uh, educational attainment uh, and also employment. Obviously, this was employment in the 19, early in the 1990s, so possibly we'd, we'd miss something about occupation uh, immediately after leaving school. 
uh, but we could say something about uh, occupation during uh, their, their certainly adulthood, certainly later adulthood. So this means then uh, that we can construct, um, and this is really the, uh, um, the, 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 what's interest here then, fairly easily in, in this sense, uh, um, because it's uh, a linkage study, then a, a new birth cohort for 1936. So we had the information uh, around birth, including things like um, parents' occupations, a social class. Uh, early life, we've got the, the measure in, in 1939. We have this uh, measure of mental ability at age 11. Uh, we can estimate uh, highest uh, we can estimate highest academic achievement. Obviously, this was measured in 1991, so it, it, it will be slightly um, inaccurate if, person, if a person took qualifications post-school, post-university. We can look at mortality over the whole time. We can estimate occupation over lifetime. And then from the 1970s onwards with the, uh, the Scottish uh, uh, health records, we can uh, start looking at hospitalisation uh, and then we have the detailed Scottish longitudinal study uh, beyond that, that period. Uh, and so particularly we look at this interesting period uh, between uh, age 55 and retirement through into older age. And as I said, looking particularly at illnesses uh, of uh, uh, later life, reflecting then what's happening in your early life. Now, the, the advantage over some of the existing cohorts that are obviously far richer in terms of the information here is the fact that uh, particularly uh, for the earlier study, which I haven't talked about, the, the earlier uh, mental uh, ability study, we can look through to people, uh, through to their, their deaths. Um, and so we can uh, explore issues of uh, around premature mortality and uh, uh, prematurity in terms of other uh, conditions uh, developing during uh, older age. Uh, and so within the ADRC Scotland, what we're looking to do is to extend this to use the full uh, uh, set of children that sat the uh, age 11 test. So that potentially produces a cohort study then of 60,000. Uh, and so our ability to therefore um, really explore issues, of, uh, particularly for rare conditions, um, are that much greater. Okay, so that, that, that's the first sort of motivating uh, example. So the second one from Scotland then is the work on the civil registration. So that's uh, birth, deaths, and marriage. And in Scotland, we had the advantage that there were very detailed and consistently detailed records uh, from 1855 uh, onwards. From 1974 onwards, it's already electronically held. So this project then is a project to transcribe these uh, records and then to move them from just being text-based transcription into a research-usable uh, data set. So um, th this is a big job in terms of uh, uh, classifying particularly things like uh, occupations that are, uh, are frequently on these records. So these will just be strings of records, so we want to move them into something that could be used in research either as a uh, a measure of social class or some other kind of derived uh, measure. And so this requires them moving them, first of all, onto some kind of standard classification, so the text into classification, uh, and then um, there were uh, uh, tables and uh, various ways of transforming this information then into things like social class. So we need to do this for occupation uh, and cause of death. And cause of death here, we're thinking of moving towards a, a version of ICD-10. I say version because, of course, in the 19th century, we'll have descriptions that uh, aren't easily um, described within ICD-10. So it's a slightly modified form uh, we're using. Uh, we're also looking at uh, geography uh, as well. Actually, I'll probably skip over geography because of time. Um, so there, there are significant uh, challenges uh, then with uh, moving these text-based pieces of information to research usable. And this is where uh, we found it very useful working with computer scientists, and particularly a set of techniques uh, around automated learning, so machine learning, and also ways of understanding text, so a natural language uh, processing. So we're starting with this, this uh, initial point of digitized records. So uh, here's, here's a, a birth uh, register um, 
for uh, 1856. So we need to translate these then. First of all, there's a transcribing process that I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, but then secondly, we need to start then looking at things uh, within the, the record itself. So here's a marriage record, and you can see there's things like uh, occupational description, civil servant, farm worker, uh, a blank, uh, and farmer. So that's uh, for the, the, the parents uh, of the bride, I think. So it's moving these kind of records then into a standard coding uh, system for many millions of records that uh, obviously we want to avoid using uh, people to do. But I mean, there's a very good uh, and well-established set of techniques for doing this. Uh, and this is a set of learning techniques. We've been practicing it on uh, existing uh, historical records. And the importance here is that what we want to do is we want to work with data where the coding is already done by a hand. In effect, we get the computer algorithms to try and learn the coding process that's been used by the human. Uh, because we've actually got the gold standard records, then we can actually compare how well the computer algorithm does uh, against uh, the, the gold standard coding, coder. So we're looking um, mainly with this historical international classification of occupation. Um, uh, and it, this is a record of, uh, sorry, it's a coding system with 330 uh, different codes. Uh, this just gives you an idea. It's, it's it's the very familiar hierarchical coding of, of occupations. So here we've got agricultural workers down through to the very specific horse workers. So you can see it's a hierarchical system of classifying uh, people. So th this is our, our example then. We've got a string that's on all these records, so shoemaker, fireman, whatever. We've got the gold standard uh, that's been classified by the historian. Uh, and then what we want to do is, sorry, want to work towards an automatic classification that we've, I've already filled this in. Um, and you can see what happens is that, uh, uh, as you might expect with the system then, uh, the computer gets it right uh, most of the time. Uh, then there's some ambiguous uh, records where it's got it wrong. And so part of this process is then trying to understand the levels of uh, error and whether they're acceptable for uh, uh, research uses. So we're using text analysis uh, um, and a, a supervised process uh, within a, a, the, the uh, a, an established uh, computing environment. So th the idea is then you take training data, uh, the, the algorithm, the, the computer learns the, uh, 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 tries to emulate what the, the human's done and creates a prediction model. Uh, so you then run this uh, on the unseen data, so data that's not classified, and that gets you the, the classification. Uh, of course, what we're interested is uh, in uh, our early modeling is to see how effective that is, so we create unseen data where we actually have the answer and compare it with the, what the machines uh, produced. So uh, moving forward then to a set of unclassified through to a classification. Um, now, these systems are reasonably simple. They just reflect sort of probabilistic use of text. Uh, this is a, a simplistic example. I've, I've used it for a classification actually of death. So this is whether someone died of uh, asthma or minor's uh, asthma. Now, you just have to imagine with this that this is actually multidimensional, that any of these different classified co codes um, that exist in the coding system uh, exists. I've just simplified it to two examples. So these are the kind of single words that are associated with records that have been gold standardly classified to, uh, to these different codings for cause uh, of death. Um, uh, and what you're trying to look is you're looking at whether a particular set of texts then pushes the probabilistic, prob uh, probability that this is minors uh, asthma through to asthma. So it's unsurprising then that asthma is used in both of these descriptions equally. It's very likely. Uh, and in this case then, um, the way you'd attribute asthma on its own is the fact that there are far more asthma deaths in a, 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 in a record system. And therefore asthma would, on its own, uh, uh, or in combination with others, would put a high probability that it's uh, asthma. Um, th these other sets, bronchial and dropsy mentioned then, are far more common with uh, asthma uh, as the classification, so that would push the probability towards asthma. Uh, then, 
of the use of terms like minors, minors. You can see this is difference in spelling that, of course, needs to be coped with the system. Then um, increases the probability that, that it's minors, uh, asthma. So a, a fairly simple uh, way, and you can use, the, there are uh, more complex ways of dealing with the, the text, but in fact these simple, naive Bayes methods actually seem to work pretty well in our uh, example. Uh, and, and what we're doing here, and this is a, a fairly simple uh, measure of quality or, or, or not, um, this is just a, an accuracy as measured by uh, how <coughs> the, the, the proportion of R codings that, that's identical to how the historians Coded. So if we're identical uh, in all cases uh, to the historian, then uh, we have achieved 100%. Um, and we've tried different techniques uh, and also combinations of techniques with uh, sort of majority vote techniques where uh, you have various uh, weighting systems to, to arrive on a final conclusion. But the main thing to just take away with this is that actually um, it's, it's, it's reasonably easy to achieve uh, rates of close to 90% uh, on the overall classification. Where it's uh, unique bits of text, that falls to about 80%, because that's slightly harder to do. But th these machine learning techniques then seem to work uh, reasonably well. Of course, this 10% difference, when you explore it, uh, does also include the error that the historians made. We've said it's gold standard, but uh, actually, of course, the historians, uh, as humans, are making different decisions at different points. So actually, we think um, uh, really, the sort of quality you can get up to um, with these systems is uh, over 95%. So the, just to finish off then, um, the, the, the second thing we're going to try and do um, with this, uh, this vital events data, so this is, if you remember, it's, it's birth, deaths uh, and marriages, is to try to look at linkage to create... Uh, not only for individuals, uh, their life courses, uh, so obviously you have their births, uh, marriages, uh, and then subsequent births to them as parents through to their deaths, so a sort of sp fairly sparse life course. Um, but then to look at linking individuals' life courses to their parents. Um, and then if you imagine that the, the, the follow-on to that then is you start reconstructing families, so you both then have the ability to look at uh, intergenerational, uh, but then in a, 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 an extension of that, the more um, linked family structure and therefore uh, pedigrees. So, uh, and you can see how we can do this for Scotland. So we've got this process of transcribing um, uh, uh, of the historical records, and then we have the already uh, electronic records. Now, this is not a, a simple process, and uh, this is very much at the moment, exploring the methodologies um, uh, that would allow us to do this. Um, although it has to be said that the, the, the detailed nature of the Scottish records means that the probabilistic matching uh, actually um, is easier than you might expect, uh, as long as the quality uh, of the, the record, so uh, a recording of somebody's name and date of birth is good. The actual ability to find unique individuals uh, from those set of variables is very good. So the idea then is that we'll uh, try and explore uh, the creation of uh, pedigrees uh, for, uh, for Scotland. Now, th there's particularly one place in the world that has done this before, and really just to finish off with uh, a motivating example of how this might be useful. So in uh, uh, Iceland, for historical reasons, because of a small population and the nature of settlement of the islands, then there's almost a, a fully existing family pedigree uh, or family structure uh, for Iceland. Uh, and this has meant, well, they've done lots of interesting things, not, some not uh, uncontroversial uh, ethically and legally, um, in, particularly in combination with genetic information, but certainly creating a very powerful scientific data set for both looking at historical uh, and particularly genetic um, uh, questions. But this is just an example of where they use this strong family uh, network information to look at the um, 1918 flu, Spanish flu, and particularly asking the question of to what extent was, uh, could a genetic disposition then make an individual more vulnerable to the, the flu. And basically what they were doing was a, f a form of family aggregation where they were looking at uh, spouses 
uh, against relations. And if you can imagine, then you can uh, understand through a, uh, the coefficient of relatedness then the extent to which vulnerability to the, the, the flu uh, might or might not be uh, making an individual more vulnerable. Obviously, they were looking at proximity. Uh, now, what's interesting actually is that this is not, uh, there was a very similar study done in Utah where they do, it's the other place in the world where they had this kind of pedigree information. And there was, there is a disagreement in findings. The, the Icelandic research team concluded that actually it was probably proximity that was more important. They didn't really find strong evidence for genetic disposition and particularly uh, very early exposure to a high level, of, a high viral load seemed to be much more important in uh, mortality. But um, it was certainly useful then in exploring that kind of question. Um, maybe just to, my last slide uh, on a more light-hearted note. <laughs> this was uh, also how they went on to use uh, their, uh, their family, uh, um, uh, family pedigree information. So a, a, an iPhone app, obviously it's important in a small population like uh, Iceland that you're aware of who your relative is. So this was sold at young people. Uh, presumably Reykjavik, who may or may not have uh, a controversial liaison that they discovered later at a family reception. So an interesting use of family aggregation data.